Hey, I'm Dos Logo, and I've been experimenting with the IBM PC's famous mode, Xvideo mode. That is a reprogrammed VGA graphics mode used by the boot screen of Windows 95 and Dos, and it's perfect for displaying old video game console games with. That is, if it's fast enough to be useful. It is time to take the common standard IBM PC, switch its internal functions to make it operate like a video game console would, which is to start a game at power on, run it lag free until power down. While running, the only priority is the game's frame rate, which must be constant, no matter what input is fed to the PC. The VGA CRT monitor connected to the PC will, in theory, provide this constant smooth frame rate as long as the PC can execute instructions and access memory fast enough, which results in the video game experience you will get on a CRT TV with a connected video game console running a video game. However, as soon as you start an IBM PC or compatible, the hardware is at the mercy of many different devices, all whom want attention, say they matter the most, and take their sweet time to block the very thing we're trying to achieve. In the past, I've been programming for the Sega Genesis, the Nintendo Game Boy Advance and Nintendo DS, and they give me full access to their hardware, and in response I get a constant smooth frame rate, no matter how bad my code was. It doesn't go that simple though when I try to program my games on a PC, you might remember playing your emulated video games on an Intel Pentium 2 processor back in the day, but did you really get a smooth frame rate? Like uh, running a 450 megahertz Pentium 2, 2 megabyte L2 cache, and it's way too big for my YouTube channel. Instead, using a completely regular Pentium 2 400 megahertz with 512 kilobytes L2 cache will have enough CPU time to complete each frame, rendering with two backgrounds and 80 full-size sprites, and also the overhead of pushing pixels in modecs. This is an IBM PC, obviously. The graphics card doesn't matter at the CPU speed, but there is a specific hidden feature in this and some other graphics cards that enables us to get what every video game console supports, and that is the vertical blank interrupt. Why would we need one in the first place? I'll get to that later, but first let's talk mode X video mode. The IBM PC's VGA video modes include a hidden set of modes by reprogramming the VGA registers in a safe manner to not blow up the monitor in the process. We know from the Windows 95 set of boot screens that such a mode X video mode works on every single compatible PC out there. But mode X writes pixels in an old planar way, switching plane with CPU output which are slow. The speed we will capitalize on comes from the secret implementation of Microsoft DirectX DirectDraw API, which allow mode X modes if specifically asked for, and this implementation is faster than Michael Abrash's graphics programming black book. So let me introduce to you the video game of choice that I will port to the IBM PC, and you might already have figured it out from the thumbnail of this video of me waving the game cartridge earlier. It is the game Sonic and Knuckles from 1994. I have managed to fully port the title screen with all its features, a few data loading optimizations, and just a few improvements because of having more CPU time compared to the original game's hardware. The choice of using Sonic and Knuckles as an example for any other video games is deliberate from my side. Hear me out. Sonic and Knuckles, built from the same engine as Sonic 3, has one of the coolest features that I can think of when it comes to playing at a constant smooth frame rate, and that is the compression and loading of graphics and data without ever missing a frame. That gives a seamless transition between huge level maps and swapping in effects mid-game. This is done in a similar fashion as a preemptive multitasking operating system does. Let's have a look at the original Sonic and Knuckles title screen sequence, captured from NTSC 60 frames per second. Use the K key to pause, use the dot and comma keys to frame step, if necessary to detect differences between this and our own implementation later.
How about that vertical blank interrupt then? The IBM PC's EGA standard, the predecessor to VGA, had a vertical blank interrupt. And VGA is backward compatible with the EGA. The issue is that many graphics card manufacturers simply didn't implement one. For example, no NVIDIA cards have a vertical blank interrupt, but a few ATI cards have, and Matrox have. It is just tricky to turn on, and the result might not be exactly the same. Still, a vertical blank interrupt gives us the edge to use some ridiculous techniques that really screams video game. Did you get that? So we will utilize the vertical blank as a timing device that can't be missed. Apply the Sonic 3D compression context switch with this timing to ensure a constant smooth frame rate even when data compression takes longer than a frame to execute. But look at the bottom border of a Sega Genesis screen and tell me what you see. That looks like garbage random pixels, doesn't it? When the Sega Genesis copy palette entries to color RAM, they get drawn in the backdrop, causing this glitch line of color dots. But what is important here is that they occur exactly at vertical blank, or around two scan lines below, visualizing where the vertical blank interrupt is happening on real hardware, where the CRT TV's raster beam happen to be at. We will choose to do the same thing since we have the power to change colors in the border using our own vertical vertical blank, which will visualize where our PC's CPU triggers the not so easy to figure out vertical blank interrupt. I'd like to quickly gloss over the whole operating system situation that the PC is supposed to require. An IBM compatible PC will always start with the CPU running in real mode, a backward compatible and protected mode allowing 32-bit register operations if available. An operating system usually jumps into the CPU's protected mode as soon as possible to manage resources and security all by itself, but in doing so there is no help from the BIOS to access video or disk services, since the BIOS operates in real mode mode. We just need our game to execute as fast as possible. However, real mode is a pain and the main reason no video game console uses Intel CPUs. In real mode, only one megabyte of RAM is accessible. It is its address space limitations that causes headaches. Code, data and stack all points to stupid non-linear addresses built from segment and offset pairs. And any misuse of those pairs causes the CPU to raise an exception. A 16-bit CPU can form a 20 bit address using a segment and offset pair, which is that one megabyte range. A segment by itself is just 64 kilobytes. And no, we can't work with that. We can use a 32 bit offset into that segment to reach beyond the 64 kilobytes in theory, but the CPU will detect that and immediately raise a general protection fault exception. If we had the power to change the CPU to allow a 32-bit offset into a segment, we could get a 4 gigabyte address space, which is plenty for a game. Luckily for us, the CPU is allowed to be configured to allow such an address space, but we aren't allowed to do that change from real mode. We must enter the CPU's protected mode. That means, in easy terms, holding your breath, diving under the water surface, do the work as quickly as possible, return to the surface, and if you succeed, seed, you are still alive. How long can you hold your breath? We turn off all the CPU interrupts, set up the stack to survive the address mode format change, hope that we will have the security privilege to touch the protected mode switch, go for it, invalidate the CPU cache and we are in. Every microsecond counts here. If a non-maskable interrupt happens, the CPU will crash. We are at the mercy of the ring zero supervisor. We only need to do one thing here, quickly change the data segment address limit from 64 kilobytes to 4 gigabytes and get out of protected mode. We're back into real mode, but something has changed. We can now access all linear memory, even if the physical memory isn't there. For the game to start at boot, we need a bootloader. I don't want to program one. I don't want to deal with disk services. It is a whole other can of worms. This is usually where a video like this would start talking Linux yes. and all that kind of stuff. But I am DOS logo. I'm a DOS person, okay? Let's use MS-DOS. Oh wait. That is exactly what we were not supposed to use. While well, MS-DOS deals with disks, hence the name Disk Operating System, we only need its single service of loading itself from any disk at boot. So let's swap out MS-DOS for our own game. 
Microsoft did this with Windows Me, that horrible operating system that removed real mode DOS, and improved nothing over its previous versions. If Windows Me can remove DOS, I can remove Windows Me and replace it with my own code, that code being our game. It's simple. Take the Windows Me bootloader called io.sys, delete everything related to Windows, DOS, basically everything, then paste in our game's code in its place, adjust the size, and the bootloader will read in itself from disk. No matter if it is a floppy disk, hard drive, FAT12, FAT16, or even FAT32, the game will boot immediately and very quickly because Windows Me was optimized for fast boot time. As soon as our game takes over, there won't be any calls to DOS or Windows as there was nothing left of that to begin with. IO.sys is now representing our game. We have gotten ourselves an operating system without writing one, which works on every single PC out there. Our game will run at startup, and this is what makes the PC act like a video game console. That's together with the constant smooth frame rate of our game. Hmm, I know this is low priority, but music is important for the demonstration of this video. I'll apologize for using a synthesizer no one can afford, but it gives me a serial interface that the game can use. After all, there is no operating system to give MIDI for free since this game is the operating system. And here we go. Inserting boot floppy disk now. Will it work? And this is showing off a perfect real VGA capture with input from the keyboard. Your YouTube experience might vary when watching this. It is weird to suggest watching this on real hardware, as my experience as a PC user over 31 years has never seen such smooth scrolling before on a PC. When people say you need to play this on real hardware, you are likely playing something emulated, but the IBM PC has never really felt like it's been more than just a powerhouse of a calculator and not some experience that can be felt. My suggestion is, if you have a retro PC setup, download the patch io.sys, paste it on a Windows 95 or higher boot floppy, and the experience will be right there with you. This is DOS logo completing my task of converting an IBM PC into a video game console. Until next time!